Well, um, I gotta say, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm honored and I'm a little shocked that I, that I get to preach again, especially after Pastor Dan got to hear me preach. So, you know, that's that's a pretty big deal. John, I may need you just just follow me on this. I'm sorry. I, that's a job I wouldn't I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. Try to follow me as I speak. So. Um, as we start today, I want you to think about this idea uh, that there are around 7 billion people that live on the earth right now. 2.5 billion of those people have not heard the gospel. Um, another 1 billion have heard a gospel that we would say is probably sketchy at best. Um, and of those 2.5 billion, 95% of them live in what we know as the 1040 window. It's, it's kind of a latitude, longitude kind of thing. Um, but really, that's the area of the world um, that, that has really the overwhelming majority of people who do not know Jesus Christ. And, and guess what, folks? We, we live in the 1040 window. This is, this is our block. This is our neighborhood now. Whether you're from Korea or whether you moved here, um, this is happening in our own backyard. And every, every second, three people die without knowing Jesus Christ. And out of those three people, two of them live in our backyard, in the 1040 window. And yet, when we look at the church in the New Testament, we see that within two generations, really 60 years, they had a believer in every town in Asia Minor. That's, that's a pretty big deal. They were bringing up individuals. They were building up individuals in Christ, and they were sending them out. And as they, well, as they built up these people, they usually they would fold them together into one place, into one church, one local expression of the body of Christ. And they would head out for the next city, the next province, the next country. Um, and, and this strategy that they had here in the book of, and we see this literally in the book of Acts, uh, this strategy was based on one word. Um, and this one word, Pastor Dan preached on us uh, several weeks ago, the word is disciple. The word is disciple. In, um, in Greek, it's the word mathetes. It should sound a little familiar. That's where we get uh, the word mathematics from. Um, but this word disciple was used 269 times in the first five books of the Bible alone. That's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. 269 times. The word Christian, any guesses? Three times in the New Testament. What word do we wear out today? Christian. What word do the New Testament wear out? Disciple. This is a big deal. Uh, what is a disciple? Literally, it means to be an understudy, a learner, a follower. Um, uh, and, and a, an understudy, a student, an apprentice. But with this, um, this studying really isn't just to gain knowledge. We're not just big Bible heads walking around here. Um, but instead, it's, um, it's to be able to reproduce this teaching into the lives of others. Um, so in, in, that fifth, in that fifth book of the New Testament, in the book of Acts, what you'll see is the New, church, the New Testament church built up people, and in, that, in doing so, the church began to explode out to the ends of the earth until the end of time. And as we begin today, I want to give you just a, just a quick progression of what happened here in the book of Acts and how, um, how important this is for us to be able to, to notice and to understand and to really wrap our heads around. Let's start with Acts 2, verse 41. It'll be up here on the screen, and, um, and you can turn there in your Bibles if you want. Uh, we're going to be flying through Scripture pretty quickly, so just disclaimer as we get started. Uh, Acts 2, verse 41. Peter is pre has preached on the day of Pentecost. He's preached, and it says, how many people, do you remember this? How many people were, were added to the church in that day? 3,000, that's right. Gold star, if I ever mumbled that out, hoping that they were right. Um, uh, 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 so, again, 3,000 souls are added on that day. That's, that's not a bad day, right? That's a pretty good thing, right? Um, and that day, there were added 3,000 souls. Now, let's look at Acts chapter 2, verse 47. Same chapter, a few verses down. What does it say? What's the term here? Again, it says added. So we're, seeing, we're getting to see a pattern here. Um, uh, Acts chapter 5, verse 14. 
Same words being used here. Added, right? The Lord was adding to their number daily those who were being saved. Addition, addition, addition. So we see this kind of building throughout the book of Acts. The first five chapters, this is all you see, really. Addition, addition, addition. People are hearing the gospel. They're trusting in Jesus Christ for salvation. This is the enlistment part, the baptizing part of the Great Commission. If you remember, Jesus made that very clear on a, on a hillside in Galilee. Famous last words, marching orders to the church. And so the first part of that is baptizing them. And it's not just dunking somebody in the water. I think we've talked about that pretty clearly here um, at, at RICC. But it's, it's sharing the gospel with people. And people trusting in Christ. So, again, we're seeing this addition happening. Um, and I want you to understand this. I'm not saying that by any means addition is bad. Addition is good. Addition is a very good thing. Um, but something changes here in Acts chapter 6. If you look at Acts chapter 6, verse 1, um, Acts chapter 6, verse 1 says, Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, increasing in number, that phrase in the original language actually is one word, it's plethuno. It's the word you, we really get the idea now for multiplication. So I want you to see this. There's um, the, through the, the first five chapters of the book of Acts, there's addition, addition, addition. And then something changes here, and we start seeing multiplication. Um, and so I want you to pause, because we've just gone through a lot of Scripture really fast. And I want you to just pause, let that sit on the back burner and marinate for a second. Um, and I want to ask you a question. If I could, if I could give you really um, 100 million won right now, or give you one wine. Well, if I give you that one wine, let, what, let's say that I, maybe I double it every day for a 31 day month. Which one would you take? The one wine is the way to go. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the only downside is it starts off really slow. And I think, actually I've got that on there. Um, I'm not normally a numbers and charts kind of guy. And let me just tell you, converting this from dollars and cents was mind-boggling. And then, and I'm sorry, my Hangugo friends, yeah, I, to try to do this in Hangugo is just impossible. So I, I gave up. Um, but again, I want you to see, like, it starts off really slow, right? Really small. Um, even up to day 27, um, it's still just, just not... Not catching up. Not enough, right? Um, it's still, I mean, it's 67 million won. 67, I mean, essentially thousand dollars. It's not bad, right? I'd walk away with that. That would be nice, right? Um, but it's not better than 100 million. Uh, but that all changes on day 28. Day 28, that doubles. Um, that doubles to 134 million. I have this written down because there's no way... I'm an English teacher. English. <laughs> Young law, right? Not, not math. Praise Jesus. Um, so, but I want you to see this. It doubles. And so now we're, I mean, we're not even at day 31 yet. And this is pretty sweet. And it just keeps getting better. By day 31, this one one, this small speck of copper, right, has now turned into 1.1 uh, billion won. That's a lot. Um, but you have, but you see, it, it's it started really small. You have to have the first one. You have to have the second one. Um, and then, so again, this idea, this is this is what's happening in the Book of Acts. You see, uh, all throughout, all up until Acts chapter six, verse one, there's addition taking place. Acts chapter six, verse one, multiplication is the better word that starts describing the church. And by Acts chapter 9, verse 31, you see that not only are individual believers multiplying, but you're seeing the church is multiplying. Um, the same word is being used here, plethuno, and so the, the entire church is multiplying now. So they were focused on building, multiplying, and reproducing disciples. And in Acts chapter 31, not again, not just individual Christians, but entire churches are multiplying to the next town, the next country. I mean, to the ends of the earth, to the end of time. And again, within two generations, within 60 years, 
They had a growing gospel witness in every town in Asia Minor. So now fast forward to today. And today we still have 2.5 billion people who haven't heard the gospel. <coughs> One billion that we're really not sure about. And so my question, and I want to ask this, is why? Why is this the situation? We got started in the book of Acts at an incredible pace. What's changed? Is it that is Jesus the same Jesus? Absolutely. Absolutely. Is the Holy Spirit still the same Holy Spirit? Yes. Is the Bible still the same Bible? Well, not exactly. This was still being written at this point. We have the advantage. We have the completed testimony of the counsel of the Word of God. We have the advantage in almost every way. Today, we can sit and look on our computer and, and, and hear teaching in our own language. We can read the Bible for ourselves. No one has to translate it to us. And we can use the internet and, and technology and travel to be able to go farther and to communicate better the gospel than we've ever done so before. So what's still missing? What's, what's the problem? How have we gone from where we were in the book of Acts to where we are now? And I would suggest to you that it's a difference of strategy. And granted, it's not a strategy that's been altogether forgotten, but I think, I think in, in many pockets of our world that the church has largely forgotten the strategy that got it to where it was just two generations after Jesus ascended into heaven. Strategy. So, why has the strategy changed? Because really, I mean, the Great Commission is still the same. That's our marching orders. That's our mandate from Jesus Christ. Our problem is, I think, we've taken something that's good, and we've put entirely too much focus upon it. I think we've taken addition. And I think, I think we've, we've put that as, as the be-all, end-all. Um, and just you think about this. I mean, you hear this in church culture. Uh, around the world. Uh, how many additions did we have last week? How many people got saved in church last week? What was our attendance like? Um, how many people came to your church on Sunday? How many people are you running on, at your church each week? David Platt said this, We can so easily deceive ourselves, mistaking the presence of physical bodies in a place for the existence of the spiritual community. You can draw a crowd with, with a Justin Bieber concert or a Lotte Giants game. It's just not the same, though. That's, that's not what we're going for. Jesus wasn't after spectators. He wasn't after um, even just converts. He was after disciples. World visionary, world impacting, radically committed followers, learners, and reproducers of Jesus Christ. So attendance is a good measure, and additions, but additions alone, additions and attendance alone are not a true measure of success in ministry. Instead, we should also be asking, who are we building? Who are we training? Who are we sending out to reach the next neighborhood, the next city to the ends of the earth, until Jesus comes back and until we die? That's the mission that we should be on. Strategy. It's a strategy thing. So with that today, I want us to look at the book of 2 Timothy. Timothy, who saw, right? Uh, let's see. Yi Zhang Yi Chou, right? So that's, that's a semester's worth of teaching theology to Korean students. That's, that's what I can do. I can do a couple of Bible books, chapters, and verses. That's, I'm, and I'm proud of that, actually. Uh, so let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. Chapter 2, verse 2. Um, this is an incredible book. Um, it's, a, it's a last letter from, from Paul to his disciple Timothy. Timothy had been his disciple. He really followed him around, done whatever Paul did, learned what Paul was doing, um, watched Paul's example. And then Paul had really sent him out. He was now at Ephesus. He was pastoring and leading there, raising up, raising up other pastors, other leaders as well. Um, and so this... This letter is just bleeding with emotion. 
Um, because the, the father-son type relationship that Paul and Timothy had uh, through disciple making, um, I think if we're not careful, we can read this book over and over and over and miss such a key verse as 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. So let's, let's read this together. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. Paul says this, And, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Since it's just one verse, let's read it again. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. And we know, um, as we study your word this morning, that the power, the power doesn't lie in preaching, but it lies in your word. And so, Father, would you open our eyes that we would behold wonderful things from it. Would you be glorified in our hearts today, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so... The question I, I love to ask my, my uh, Pauline epistle class. <laughs> Who wrote this book? Paul, yeah, yeah. And, and after, after 15 weeks of asking that, you can understand that probably gets a little old. Paul, yeah, okay. All right, so, uh, so who wrote this book? Paul, and who was Paul? Who was Paul? Uh, well, he was an apostle. He was, he was a leader within the church. And, and so, and I want you to see this. This is Paul, the discipler, the disciple maker, sending a letter to his, to his son, really, in the faith, Timothy. Uh, his understudy, his disciple. Um, Paul, again, is near death here. He's, he's in prison in Rome. He, doesn't, he knows what's about to happen. He knows that, it, that death is on the way. Um, and so he's, he's kind of summing up everything that he's really taught Timothy. Um, he's guarding against false teachers. Apparently there were false teachers there. And so he's setting up a contrast, even, what he, even in these last words. He's setting up a contrast between true doctrine and false teaching. Um, and so in this, in this pep talk, I want you to see, and specifically in this verse, there are four generations. Four generations that take place here. First you've got, you've got Paul. Uh, Paul is really, I guess you could say, this is kind of like the first generation. Um, and then you have Timothy. And I think this is even this is even up here as well, John. Um, you have Paul and then Timothy. Paul has invested his life and the gospel into Timothy. Timothy then invests his life into faithful men. Uh, faithful men then invest themselves in the gospel into others also. And so I want you to see this is really how this is working. It's branching out. It's exploding out. Um, really in whatever direction that the Lord would ordain. And so, um, but then again, I want you to see this. Where does it start? It starts with one man. It starts with Paul. Um, really, one man investing his life in the gospel into another man, Timothy. And so this is, I want you to see this. There, there are two little things we can really gather from this. First, it shows us the importance of individuals. It starts with one person taking everything they know about the gospel and pouring it into another person. But not only their knowledge, but their very life. They're doing life together. Um, and so it starts with this one person like Paul, but it also includes someone like Timothy who's willing to come alongside and learn under that person. Second, it shows us the importance of strategic, intentional relationships. One man to one man or one woman with one woman um, but the relationship has to be intentional. You, the Paul, has to be willing, has to be building and training for the purpose of reproduction. It's not just, hey, listen to what I've got to say. But it's, hey, let's do life together. There are some very important things that I want to share with you so that then you can take these things and share them with other people. Expecting them to do the same. There's a little bit more accountability to it than just, hey, listen to me. I've got something important, right? Um, so it has to be an intentional relationship. And you could say, you know, where's Dave this morning? Dave. You could say, just for the purpose of illustration, I could say, hey, Dave, you know, man, I care about you. Uh, 
I want you to, I want to, I want to disciple you. I wouldn't necessarily use those words. Um, but um, here's what we're going to do. We're going to meet together, and we're going to have an accountability group. Maybe a couple of us will meet together. Uh, you know, you'll say, oh, I'm struggling with this, and I'll say, oh, I'm struggling with this. And we'll all just admit that we're kind of struggling with sin together, and uh, you know, at least there's a brotherhood that way. But this, can, this, there, this can be a good thing. Accountability among brothers and sisters in Christ can be a good thing. Um, but there's something missing. Um, I'm not training him to reproduce these things into the life of other people. There's more accountability to it than that. The relationship has to be toward the end that a young man or young woman is being built for reproduction, to reproduce the gospel through their own life into the, into the lives of other people. And so with this verse this morning, I want to just, we're going to stick with this verse, and I want you to look at four, four elements of this verse, four, really four people, people groups in this group, in this verse. Um, <laughs> sorry, that was wrong. Really four things in this verse that I think will help us to kind of wrap our heads around what's happening here. And help us understand how, how we can do this as well. Um, first thing I want you to see is, is the word heard. What you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. Uh, the question is, then if, if Paul is telling Timothy to entrust the things that he's heard from Paul to faithful men, then I want to know, what did, what did he hear from Paul? What did Timothy hear from Paul? Um, and so the word here, the word here in the original language is akuo. And it doesn't really just mean for sound to pass into your ear. It means a total intake of everything you've seen, everything you've heard, everything you've experienced. And so all of Paul's understanding of the gospel, but also his life, is included in this herd. And you can, if we actually want to look at the same book, uh, but 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, it'll be up here on the screen. Um, this is really a list that Paul is recounting of what he's invested into Timothy. Paul says to Timothy in verses 10 and 11, You, however, and again, he's noting this contrast, right? Uh, you, you follow my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from, the, from them all the Lord rescued me. So, let's think about this. What did, what did Timothy hear from Paul? First, he heard teaching or doctrine teaching or doctrine. Um, as Timothy traveled with Paul on, on Paul's missionary journeys, he heard Paul preaching and teaching other people. But like Jesus did, and I want to suggest to you, this is not just a Paul thing, this is a Jesus thing. Um, and everybody that Jesus trained did this as well. Um, but just like Jesus did, Paul was teaching Timothy on the job, through life as they went. Um, and I, there are two men, uh, really, that I think about in my life that have done that with me. Uh, Jerry Bradley in Milledgeville, Georgia, and Daniel Money in Memphis, Tennessee, guys that, that took me alongside them and said, hey, um, I, want to, I, want to, I want you to really have a window in my life. I want you to see how I make the decisions that I do. I want you to see uh, the, way that, uh, the way the gospel shapes the way that I treat my wife and my family, the way that it shapes the way I do my job. And so I, I had, a, had a, a front row seat to be able to see this flesh out in these guys' lives. Um, and I'm I'm eternally grateful for that. Um, so, and again, um, even things that might seem trivial, like, hey, let's go to the grocery store together. Hey, we need to run and go get this stuff for service tomorrow. Let's, let's go ahead and, I mean, why don't you come with me, and we'll talk about some things as we go. That kind of thing. Um, we see this in Paul and Timothy's life as well. Paul, uh, in 2 Timothy 1, verse 13, says, retain the standard of sound doctrine. Really, it means an exact copy. So he says, the things that I've taught you, retain these things, guard these things, and entrust them to others as well. So Timothy heard Paul's teaching. He heard also his conduct, his way of life. This means not only did Timothy hear Paul's doctrine, but he heard, he watched how, how uh, like I just said, how he conducted himself, how he applied the Bible in his life. This is what you're doing even when you're not in front of people um, this is how you treat your waitress. Again, how do you treat your wife and family? How do you treat um, <laughs> how you treat people even when they're not in front of you? Like, right? just when you talk about people, how do you do that? Um, so Timothy heard Paul's life, his teaching and conduct. Uh, third, aim in life. A lot of great verses for this that we see. Um, 
My favorite two are Philippians 1.21. We talked about that a few weeks ago. Galatians 2, verse 20. Um, can you imagine? I just This boggles my mind. Just to think about this. That Paul and Timothy may be walking into a town like Lystra or Iconium. Um, not really knowing what's going to happen there. These were towns that were really dangerous uh, throughout their ministry. Um, and Paul saying to Timothy, Hey, Timothy, remember... To live is Christ. And to die is gain. So no matter what happens, glorify Him. Um, or maybe Timothy was getting ready to share the gospel uh, with someone in Ephesus and Paul pulling him aside and saying something like, don't forget, Timothy. You're already crucified with Christ. Your life is now hidden. In God with Christ. and your, um, your life now is, is trusting in the Son of God. So don't, don't do this under your own strength. Trust in God's Word. Trust in His Spirit to lead you and to guide you. Um, and we've got these things written down, but Timothy was living this with Paul. Um, and, and he invested, Paul invested this, he transferred this to the young man that he was discipling. It says his faith. He heard Paul's faith. Uh, certainly Paul trusted God. And Paul would have communicated the Gospel on several different occasions. But specifically, I want... You think about how Paul trusted that God was working in him. I think about Philippians 2, verses 12 and 13. And how as Paul, as Paul was trusting that God was giving him the power and the desire to do what, God ple what, what pleases God, that he would have been faithful in everything that he did. Uh, he would have been faithful to God's calling upon him as an apostle to the Gentiles. He would have been faithful to the churches that he had started and that he had visited. He was faithful to the people God had entrusted to him. His faithfulness. And, and he's, he's entrusting and transferring that to Timothy as they went together. This as you're going type transfer. His patience. First Timothy, or I'm sorry, First Thessalonians, Paul says he desired to get back to this, to this city of Thessalonica, but, but that Satan had hindered him. Literally, Satan had cut, cut in front of them and wouldn't let them go back. Acts 16, Paul's trying to get to certain areas to teach, but Acts says that the Holy Spirit forbid him to speak in these areas. He's trying to go to Bithynia to the north, I think Mysia to the south, uh, and somehow he ends up in this city called Troas. So as Paul, Paul has things he thinks he needs to be doing, these things seem to be very important to him. God's opening and closing doors, and Paul ends up where God wants him. And well, I want you to see this, this may sound a little complicated, but... Paul, Paul is doing all these things and Timothy is alongside him. Timothy is watching. He's seeing these things take place. And he's learning not just some, some bullet points and an outline, but he's learning and watching this unfold in life. See, Paul also says, love. You, you've heard my love. In these verses, Paul calls Timothy, uh, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy verse one, uh, chapter 1, verse 2, 2 Timothy 2, verse 1. In both of these, Paul refers to Timothy as his child. His child. This is, this is, and Paul's not his dad. Let me make that clear, right? This is how, how intimate, how deep this relationship was between these two guys. This is definitely a father-son kind of relationship. Um, and so, even as Timothy might have rebuked, or even as Paul might have rebuked Timothy about things, even as he's instructing him, Timothy can take all of this in stride knowing that it's coming from someone who loves him dearly. I think about Simon Peter and how, I mean, this guy stuck his foot in his mouth on a regular basis. And Jesus was known to rebuke him. But at the same time, Peter could take these things in stride knowing, knowing that Jesus loved him. And that should, that should be fleshed out in our relationships with people that we're doing this with as well. So then the next three, they're kind of grouped together. Persecutions, sufferings, and steadfastness, steadfastness and endurance. Um, Paul, is, Paul is a lot like a boxer in the book of Acts. He, um, he gets beat down and he gets back up. Beaten down, back up. Beaten down, back up. And he was persecuted, he suffered. But the most important thing is that he endured he endured these things. He got back up and he kept moving forward. Why? Because he was being led by the Spirit. The Spirit of God was working in him 
and producing this ability to keep going, even when it seemed impossible. And we said we read this a few weeks ago, but I think it bears repeating. Uh, 2 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 29, also can be on the, on the screen here. Um, Paul is talking about the persecutions that he's endured, the suffering that he's endured, and he says this. Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. He's, he's making ridiculous statements uh, to show, uh, again, a contrast between him, the gospel that he's preaching, and false teachers that are in the midst of this Corinthian church. He says, I'm talking like a madman, with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, often near death. Five times um, I received from the hands of the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Uh, three times I was shipwrecked. Uh, and day and night I was adrift from the sea. Uh, on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. And apart from all these things, I have the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak, who is made to fall and I am not indignant. So this man is enduring a tremendous amount of stuff here. And through this, he's being watched. Did you ever think about the, the possibility that maybe people are watching how you deal with this? And, how, and the way that you deal with difficulty may say more about what you believe about Jesus Christ than you ever imagined. Good times. <laughs> Those are good too. But I think there's something about this. And this spoke loudly to Timothy. Um, and so he's, he's learning from this. Um, <coughs> And he gives three specific examples, places that he endured suffering. And I think it's, it, it, it's worth thinking about this town of Lystra. Um, you want Timothy to remember what happened specifically here. Um, it's happened in Acts 14. Paul and Barnabas went to Lystra for the first time. Um, and Acts says there was a man who was crippled from birth that was there. God heals the man uh, through these guys. And the people in town think to themselves, surely the gods must have come down. And so they uh, they start to worship Paul and Barnabas as Greek gods, Zeus and Hermes. They said that Barnabas is, is uh, Zeus, and that Paul, since he's the one who's speaking, he's got to be Hermes, the messenger of the Greek gods. And so Paul and Barnabas, they basically say, whoa, hold up. Er, easy. Don't worship us. We're just men like you. And they start sharing the gospel with them there. Um, so, um, and so some Jews find out that Paul and Barnabas are there, that they're preaching the gospel, and they basically come and they start a riot. Um, Paul is dragged out of Lystra and stoned. Um, and we're not really sure there if, if that means that he was stoned to death or if he was stoned almost to death. Um, either way, to have been stoned, uh, basically to have huge stones thrown upon you, until they pile up, essentially you're left for dead in the middle of a field or at the bottom of a cliff. Um, either way, this is a miracle. <laughs> the fact that he survived this uh, is a miracle. So he gets up and he goes back into Lystra. The very place where he had just been um, essentially mobbed against and, and they tried to put him to death. And he gets back and he goes straight into town. Um, and then he goes a few kilometers down the road uh, to the next town, and then it says he comes back to Lystra. Now, why is this important? Because this is Timothy's hometown. Timothy's first encounter with Paul is that Paul was that guy who was stoned for preaching this message, and he came back. What a picture, right? How we deal with difficulty and suffering reveals more than we could ever dream about who we believe Jesus Christ is and what his worth is in our lives. So all these things together, all these things together, um, Timothy heard from Paul, and now Paul gives one command, one, um, one, I, one, really, one thing that, Paul needs, or that Timothy needs to do with this, and it's entrust. Entrust. 
This word entrust, this is a banking term. Um, the idea of entrust is that you would, you would go to the bank, you'd make a deposit, an investment for some reason, to get back. Later on, you'd get your deposit back, the initial money that you put in, right? And you'd get a return. Um, some money that your money earned for you while it was in the bank, right? Like you're sending it out like, all right, money, get to it. Make some money for me, you know? And so you want to see, again, your initial deposit and the return. Um, and so Paul is saying, um, Paul is saying, Timothy, you've seen my life, you my teaching, my patience, my endurance, my love. I need you to take all these things. I want you to invest them in someone else, in the same kind of classroom of life teaching that, you, that you've uh, received from me. And Paul wanted him to do it in such a way that later on, Paul would be able to return and see two things. One is his original deposit, the gospel, correct doctrine, um, and how this influences his life. And I want you to think about this. 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 8, Paul says, For now we live if you are standing firm in the Lord. We're in the people business, folks. And then entrusting the gospel to other people, it, it's supposed to last. And if it doesn't last, it never took root to begin with. Uh, and so we, we live, according to Paul here, we live to invest this gospel through our lives into other people. And so if this is what we're investing our lives in, we want it to last, right? And so, again, so this, there's this initial investment. And then there's the return, the interest. That then they, our disciples, Paul's disciples, would take these things and invest them into others. It's not just enough that I've given these things to you and you keep them and you guard them. That's good, but it's not enough. It's that you take these things and you do the exact same thing so that we start seeing multi-generational faithfulness to the gospel. This is what Jesus talked about in his parable of the ten minas. And there are three things that really, there are, there are two things rather that are eternal. The word of God and the souls of men. And if... If really these are the only two things that are eternal, don't we need to live for eternal things? Don't we need to live for eternal things? What kind of interest, what kind of interest is being, has been produced in your life to this moment? First, is the deposit standing, standing firm? Is the deposit there? Is it guarded? Is it, is it taken care of? What kind, of, what kind of return is Jesus getting from his investment? Something to think about. So Paul says, the things that you've experienced from me, you entrust them. And not just to anyone, but to who? Third, to faithful men. To faithful men who will be able to teach. And this is, this is where we invest our life and our teaching. And this is where we do this. This is with faithful men and women. Um, your life, my life, will be one of two kinds of transactions. It's either going to be an expenditure, uh, which is really a one and done kind of thing. We're kind of like well said, right? This is uh, where you pay you pay money and you never see it again, right? Or it's going to be like John said, and maybe a little more, um, because we're we're getting our money back, we're getting our investment back, and then some. Um, and so um, Dawson Trotman. Uh, a guy that, that wrote a lot about this, he, he said that you're, you need to look for, for people that really have three things going for them. One, they're faithful. Two, they're available. And three, they're teachable. Faithful, available, and teachable. That's right, folks. We're looking for fat people. That's right. <laughs> faithful, available, and teachable. You want people who are hungry. <laughs> joke, joke. Uh, you want people who are hungry for... For training for the word, and so you invest these things to them. You cannot disciple someone who's not faithful. You'll be wasting the time that God's given you and the teaching that He's given you as well. And how did Paul describe faithfulness for Timothy? And we don't even have to look at another verse. It's right here in Second Timothy two two. Um, sometimes, sometimes in the Bible, you see this a little bit better in Greek. Um, but sometimes in the Bible, uh, the Holy Spirit really emphasizes things. And so we see in Greek, there's, ma there's minor emphasis and there's major emphasis. Minor emphasis is when it's said that the Spirit whispers. And, 
And major emphasis is when the spirit shouts. Hi, wake up. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> Welcome back to the world. Congratulations. Um, and so here in this verse, there is a major emphasis. And so my question to you is to think about where would the major emphasis in this verse be? Where would it be? For the shortness of time, we'll just go ahead and tell you, it's others. It's others. Of all the places in this verse, it's others. The things that you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, and trust these things to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. That's the emphasis of the verse. So it's not just on Paul. It's not even on Timothy. It's not even on faithful men. But it's gearing towards a fourth generation. Maybe a generation that we won't even see. It's gearing towards others also. And so what Paul did, and this is what Paul did because he saw the best way, and I want you to hear this. He saw the best way to go about this because it's what Jesus did was to see the masses through the man and to build the man to reach the masses. I'll say that again. He saw the masses through the man and he built the man to reach the masses. Certainly this applies with women too. Um, of course, Correo, Correo. Um, so, but I want you to see this. Like This is what he did. And it led to an ever-increasing others also. I mean, we're sitting here reading this today, right? This is proof that it works. <laughs> it could not have happened in the way that it did unless some people kept at this. And so I want you to see, like, when Christianity properly functions, it produces multi-generational faithfulness to treasuring the gospel and making disciples who make disciples who make disciples to the ends of the earth, to the end of time. And so in closing today, I want to ask you really two questions. First, if you were Satan, and I hope you're not. <laughs> let's, let's, let's keep that clear, right? Alright, so if you were Satan, where would you want to destroy this whole thing? If you could derail this whole process, where would you want to start? Start with Paul. As the great theologian Barney Fife said, nip it in the bud, right? Cut off the whole process before it even starts. And so the, the easiest thing for us to do today is to think, wow, that's a pretty tall order. I don't know if I can handle that. I don't know if my life is in a place where other people can watch my life and learn from me. I'm not a good teacher. I don't think I can handle this. I don't think, I, I, you know, all these different things. And Satan knows this. He knows this about man's heart, that we are bent towards sinning. And so his thing is if he if he can get if he can get this one this one person distracted, derailed, disqualified in the eyes of other people, caught up in sin and self, or in fear, thinking this is too hard, too much to learn, look at what you prevent. So instead, let's be strengthened by the grace of God. Where did you get that from, Dustin? Well, I got it from this passage. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. The verse before this verse. Paul says, You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Jesus Christ. This whole thing is based on on the grace of God expressed through the gospel. The gospel. That the just and gracious God of the universe who created everything that exists looked upon hopelessly sinful people. It's you and me. And he sent his son, God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, to bear his wrath and sin on the cross and to show his power over death and the resurrection so that all who trust in him turning from their sin and themselves and trusting in Him, we thought, right? We'll be reconciled to Him forever. 
And again, the gospel is not just the A, B, C's of being a Christian. It's the A through Z. It's everything. Everything for the rest of my life, for your life. We can gain direction, purpose from the gospel. And so with this, be strengthened by the grace of God in Jesus Christ. This is what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 28 when he said, And behold, I am with you to the end of the age. How good is it to know that Jesus Christ is with us as we do this? That we don't have to do this on our own. And really we shouldn't. Because we will burn out trying. We will start feeling like everybody's looking over my shoulder, so I've got to be good so that I can earn up to this standard. And we're living, at that point we're living in hypocrisy. And we just, we can't sustain that. We're not meant to sustain that. But if we do, if we do this, if we trust that God is working in us, giving us the power and the desire to do what pleases Him in making disciples, then it will not only produce fruit in the lives of other people, but it's going to produce fruit in our lives. It's going to grow us. Other than being married, a few things, few other things I can think of sanctify us as much as making disciples. It's a whole new level of accountability. I mean, think about it. You're building relationships with people. And with that, you begin to love them in Christ. And you begin to watch them grow. But know that they're watching you. They're, they're learning from you. And there's this transparency in this relationship. Um, because you're doing life together. And they're watching your life. It's another reason I don't want to do something stupid. Now notice, it's another reason. It's not the reason. It's another reason. Why well, I don't want to do something stupid in my marriage. Or in another area of my life that would harm my ability my platform to be able to, to train up other people. It's a whole new level of accountability. I'm praying like I've never had before. I'm praying for these guys and that the Holy Spirit will protect me and guide me and shape me. Direct what I say and what I do. There's an incredible amount of growth that comes along with this. And I think Jesus has designed it that way. Second, let me ask you this question. What have we done with this strategy? Kind of bring it around full circle here. If you remember, <clears throat> at the beginning today, we said that when the New Testament church did this, within 60 years, they had a growing gospel witness in every town in Asia Minor. And what have we done with that today? The focus there was on individual responsibility. And I think the result was exponential multiplication. What we've done with that today is we've replaced it with we replace the responsibility of the individual with the responsibility of the institution or with other individuals other than us, right? We've left the responsibility of the Great Commission largely to pastors, to missionaries, to other leaders, or to our church as an organization. And I think we can all agree that what we, what we leave as a responsibility to everyone quickly becomes the responsibility of no one. And that's why, I mean... We're in this place now where we've, we've swapped out this catch and release, this uh, building up to be sent out with a come and hear. Many churches in the world today, that's, that's their deal. I've heard pastors actually say, hey, you just bring your friends and I'll get them saved. And we reduce our involvement in, the, in accomplishing Jesus Christ's command to our, that's supposed to dominate our lives. We reduced it to just, just asking people to come to church with us. Now, granted, asking somebody to come to church is great, but it needs to be a part of something bigger that's happening, a relationship that's being formed. So in doing this, we've turned Jesus' strategy upside down, and it would be crazy for us to expect the same result that we saw in the book of Acts. So instead, let's be obedient to Jesus' strategy. The question isn't how much we battle, but how many people... But how many people and what kind of people, what quality of people are we training up and sending them out? And there's a lot of different flavors of this. There's a lot of different ways of doing this. Some that are, that are really, really exciting to some people and that other people just, ah, I don't like that. I don't like the way that that works. There are lots of different styles of doing this. And we're not, let's just not argue about how that gets done. But let's agree on what Paul is saying, that it needs to be done. And it needs to be done at least according to the way that Paul's describing it. 
And it starts with us. And we need to be intentional about this. So we can't, and, and I, I want you to know this, I, I love the direction that our leadership is taking us as a church. I'm stoked about that. And I can't wait to see what God's going to do. But I think this is, this is more than just a leadership thing. This is each one of us as individuals within church. We, we can't just come on Sundays and just passively sit by and then leave and think that we've done our church thing for the week. When we gather together, let's come together to be equipped, to be built up, to be trained, so that then when we scatter back out into the world, it's not that we're asking people to come just to come to church, but we go out as the church, and the church is then scattering out into the world to be salt and to, and to be light. Let's do the thing that God has called us to do. And in doing so, let's view being here together as brothers and sisters in Christ on Sundays differently. Let's view our community groups differently. And let's look at them the way that God has set for us to. To be encouraged. To be built up so that we can be sent out. These steps must happen in this order. If you don't hear, you can't entrust. If you don't entrust, you don't need faithful men. And if you don't find faithful men, you will not multiply others. And so, as we as we kind of as we end today, I, you may be thinking, Justin, I don't, I don't, I'm not even a follower of Christ. I'm not even a Christian, much less a disciple maker. Um, and that's a good point. Um, you can't be a disciple maker of Jesus Christ if you're not in Christ, right? And so, um, my challenge to you, is my, I'm begging you, please trust Jesus Christ. Don't, don't put it off. Don't wait. Trust Jesus Christ for salvation today. Um, you may be saying, Justin, I, I need training to do what Paul's talking about here. This sounds all well and good, but I need to be able to see it. Maybe you're like me. I'm, I'm a visual person. Somebody can explain something to me, but if I see it actually happen, I'm, I'm so much better off. And so maybe that's you. Maybe, you that, maybe you've never had this kind of relationship in your life. Maybe you just feel completely unequipped to do this and you need someone to help you. And so my challenge to you is during this time as we, as we do the Lord's Supper and as we, as we reflect on what God's Word has said, begin praying. Begin this process of praying that God would reveal to you someone around you, someone in this church. They can take you alongside of them and say, hey, here's how we live out the Christian life. This is how we do prayer. This is how we read the Word. This is how we study. This is, um, uh, this is how it affects my job and my family all these different things. Pray that God will reveal someone. And then talk to your elders. I'm, I'm pretty sure they're excited about the possibility of, you know, I, I mean, I'm assuming. I, I think I know them that well. Um, and then you may be saying, Justin, I know I need to be doing this. I know that I've been equipped. I know that I've sat under a lot of teaching. And I haven't been doing this. And that's a great place to be. It's a great place to be. Confess that to the Lord. Uh, all sin, whether it's intentional or unintentional, it's still sin. So confess that to the Lord. Then ask God to give you the power and the desire to make disciples according to His strategy. And my prayer um, is that, uh, first of all, for you individually, that as you go throughout this week and the weeks to follow, that you would begin this process of praying, God, show me people around me that I can disciple. And it may not be just people that are Christians. It may be someone who doesn't know Christ at all. And that's, that's a part of the Great Commission. Maybe somebody who doesn't know Christ at all. Maybe a coworker. Maybe a student. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe someone in your own family. And God has put them all around you. Every day. And He's put you in that situation so that the church, the church then has access into the lives of these people. We are the church. And secondly, my prayer is for ICC, our Redeemer ICC, that we would be a church that wholeheartedly pursues as individuals partnering together that we would be, we would be hard-pressed after this, this, this vision of making disciples to the ends of the earth until the end of time. So let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you so much for your word. Father, I pray more than just hearing a sermon. Father, I pray that we've heard your word. 
I pray that it's clear in our hearts. I pray that you would speak to us in a way uh, that, that mere, mere words of man cannot. That you would help us to see this. And once we've seen it, Lord, I pray that we can't unsee it. That this would forever shape the way that we view other people. Forever shape, forever shape the way that we view about ourselves. Lord, help us to do your will today. Help us to glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.